Okay, let's take a look, take a look at uh, question two from the practice exam. It's a true-false question. So uh, let's just look at this first thing. It says, if the limit as x goes to 1 of f of x is pi, and the limit as x goes to 1 of g of x is 0, then the limit as x goes to 1 of f of x over g of x does not exist. And this is uh, true. And the reason is that as x gets closer and closer to 1, the top gets closer and closer to pi. And uh, so, right, because the limit as x goes to 1 of f of x is pi. And the thing in the denominator gets closer and closer to 0, so it's pi over something very small. And um, so, you know, when you take the reciprocal of something very small, you get something very big. So this is very big. Okay, there's a tiny subtlety here um, because we don't know if, if g of x is a very small positive number or a very small uh, negative number, but it so it's either going to be a very big negative or a very big positive, but it doesn't matter because either way um, it's not it's not going to be you know it's not going to be any any fixed finite number because it's going to exceed all numbers you know in magnitude it'll be either bigger as a negative or bigger as a positive or whatever so it does not exist all right and so that's why the answer to a is true then let's look at b here so it says if the limit as x goes to one of f of x is zero and and g of x also goes to zero then uh, the limit is of f of x over g of x does not exist. And uh, the answer here is false. So this is something that your brain might, might tell you is true, um, um, even though it's not, because you know that 0 over 0 is nonsense, right? So maybe it's always the case that if two things go to 0, then, then you get something undefined at the end. But um, so consider something like this. The limit as x goes to 1 of x minus 1 over x minus 1. OK, so just take a look here. And you can see that um, this is exactly the same situation that the question is describing. So something on top is going to 0. Something on the bottom is going to 0. Um, and what happens, OK, so you can see that, that at x exactly 1, you get 0 over 0. And that's not defined. But we're taking a limit, and so the limit doesn't care what happens exactly at 1. It just cares what happens, you know, uh, around 1. And around 1, what happens? You get something over itself is always is always 1. Okay, so actually this limit is 1. So in particular, it exists, right? It's the, it's the number 1, which is a number which exists, unless you're in philosophy class or something. And so sometimes it does exist, and that's why this statement is false. All right, and um, okay, so let's go on and take a look here at C. C says if P is a continuous function, then the limit as X goes to 6 of P of X is P of 6. And this is very true. It's extremely true because this is just the definition of being continuous at 6, right? Remember we did, we wrote this a bunch in, in the answer to the first question. What does it mean to be continuous at 6? It means that the limit as x goes to 6 of p of x is just p of 6, right? And so if p, of, if p is a continuous function, then yes, this is true, because that's just the definition of being continuous. Um, OK, and all right. So this one kind of reminds me a little bit of b, you know, because uh, it's saying that something goes to infinity, another thing goes to infinity. Well, what happens if you take the limit of their difference? Your brain might say something like, well, infinity minus infinity is zero. Um, okay, but that's actually not true. It's not, not true. And the reason is, so the answer to this is false. And the reason is that um, maybe f goes to infinity much, much slower than g of x. So you have kind of this slow infinity minus a fast infinity. And what happens as x goes to 0, it, this might turn out to be something like 5, you know, or it could turn out to be infinity if, if the first thing is much, much slower than the second thing. This is then what you'd have like, um, you know, maybe by the time this 
maybe by the time f gets up to like a million bajillion, g has only gotten up to two or something, right? And so then the limit as x goes to zero of the difference could be infinity or anything you want. Um, sorry. Yeah, okay. So it's false. And you should just kind of save, store as a little post-it note in your brain that infinity minus infinity can be anything. And zero over zero as a limit can be anything. Okay, and um, all right. So let's, let's take a look at E. It says, if f and g are continuous at one, and f of one is something negative, then, and g of one is zero, then the limit as x goes to one of this of this quotient is negative infinity. So you think, yeah, that must be true, right? Because g is going to zero and f is always negative. So we've got like uh, something negative over something going to zero is negative infinity. This is probably actually the most subtle and sneaky question on this list. Um, the answer is false. And it's for this kind of sneaky reason that maybe g goes to zero from the negative side. So you could have something like what you know is you're going to get close enough to one that on top you're going to have something negative. Okay, so I'm going to put a negative on top. Now um, g of one is zero, and so as x goes to one, you're going to have something very small on the bottom, but you don't know whether it's a very small negative or a very small positive. Now let me just let's suppose for the sake of argument that it's a small negative. Well, now you've got a negative number over a small negative. This is the same as like just a, you know, it's basically like one over just a small number. And the negative signs cancel and you get something big. Okay? And so you can you can force this limit to be positive infinity, right? Positive infinity instead of negative infinity. So it doesn't necessarily have to be negative infinity. In fact, if if g goes to zero from the negatives, then you can make it positive infinity, and that's why this one is false. All right. Okay. So what about f? F is the intermediate value theorem in disguise. So remember the intermediate value theorem from class. So it says that if you have a continuous function. Let me get out. I think this makes one of these makes my handwriting good. Did that? Yeah, okay. Let's draw some axes here. So it says f is continuous on this interval from minus one. Uh, maybe I'll just make it a little longer. Uh, what is that gonna no, sorry. Okay, I'll try to draw it again. Okay, now let's put negative one here and positive one here. And it says if f is continuous from negative one to one, and f of minus one is four, so let me put four here. Okay, so we'll say that this is four. And f of one is three, so I'm going to kind of exaggerate things here. Here's f of one is three. Then there exists a number r with absolute value less than one, so that's kind of a fancy statement. What does it mean? It just means that there's some r here in between. Um, negative one and one, okay, and uh, what's true about r, what's interesting about r is that f of r equals pi, and it seems complicated, but it's true, and this is really just the intermediate value theorem, and remember what the intermediate value theorem says, um, you know, pi is some number between three and four, so I'll just draw a line here, so let's say that this line happens exactly at pi on the y-axis. So the, remember the intermediate value theorem says that if I'm going to continuously connect this dot, maybe I should switch colors here, so him, I want to connect him to him with a continuous line, then I have to cross this barrier, right? That's what the intermediate value theorem says. Okay, and so this crossing point is what gives you r. So r is the number so that when you put it into the function, pi comes out. So f of r equals pi. Okay, and so that's why that this is that's why this is true. You should keep in mind that this only works if f is continuous. Okay, and so that's it for those true false questions.